What's going on, everybody? I'm your host, Eric Threat II. Here at Hardwood Heroes, we bring something fresh every episode. We have a new segment called Miked Up, where you'll get to hear the interesting things your TBC coaches have to say. Joseph Payton will break down the Belpre girls and the Southern boys. And as always, our reporters will discuss the week in the TBC. So stay tuned for episode five of Hardwood Heroes. Now, before we hop into our segments, we gotta talk about the TBC standings after this week. Three divisions of the TBC had their first and second place teams hoop it out for the top spot. And all three first place teams made sure everyone knew why they were number one. Here are the standings as of Friday. In a defensive struggle, Waterford beat Eastern by four, which stretches its TBC hawking lead to two games. But the Lady Eagles still have not lost two games in a row. They bounced back against Belpre on Thursday. Southern fell to the fifth spot after losing three, or its last three games, while the middle ladies have won three of their last four games. Waterford swept their season series with Trimble and Miller, and now they hold a two-game lead in the Hawking. Eastern beat Belpre this week, maintained their conference lead, and South Gallia, they beat Fedhawk by 30 again. And they got their second conference win. Now, Vinton County, man, they escaped on Friday, beating Megs by only one point. The Marauders have caused the Vikings some problems this year, but good teams find a way to win. The Bulldogs are sitting a game back. They still have a shot to overtake Vinton County. The Alexander Lady Spartans aren't looking over their shoulder anymore as they clinch the TVC Ohio in the month of January. They beat their opponents by almost 34 points per game. Every other, TV, every other team in the TVC Ohio had at least one game this month where they scored 34 points or less. Alexander is the truth. I didn't even cover it all. They're on a 13 game winning streak. Nobody is touching the Lady Spartans right now. Alexander reporter Connor Martin is here. Ah, they're chilling right now, man. Eric, they are straight up chilling up there in that top spot. I mean, this team is used to winning. In fact, they just won the TVC Ohio outright for the first time under head coach Corey McKnight. The last time Alexander was outright champion, Leah Richardson was in the sixth grade. Now, she's a leading scorer on this team. This past Monday, Leah dropped 21 points against Nelsonville York, eliminating any hope the Buckeyes had for winning the TVC. The Lady Spartans dominated the boards, collecting 36 rebounds, while holding Nelsonville York's ace, Jesse Addis, to 15 points on their way to a 55-34 point victory. However, they had a tough non-conference matchup against Huntington on Friday. The Lady Highlanders shattered Alexander's 13-game win streak with a 29-point win. While Leah may be the leader of this team, you cannot forget to give Coach McKnight credit for what he has done. In his third year as Alexander's head coach, he has turned the Lady Spartans into a TVC powerhouse as they have yet to drop a single conference game all season. 16-3, he wins ballgames as part of his job description, but we like to take it a little further here. Who is the man behind the whistle, man? Actually, Eric, McKnight refuses to use a whistle. He says it's too authoritarian, but personally, I don't think he needs one. His voice is plenty loud enough. Hey, like I said, this is what we do. This is what we do. Biggest game of their lives is what we do. It's another day in the freaking park. All right, let's go. I love you. Let's go. Get around it. We're all telling you. But we have to win it on that end down there. Win it down there. Let's go. Listen, diagonal two again from the baseline. Go, Rachel, go, Rachel! Chum! You can still go, I don't care. I don't care, go. Put your stamp on this league. Put your stamp on it. Go. Go, baby. Finish on three, one, two, three, finish. And you heard it from the main man himself. The Lady Spartans are putting their stamp on this league. All season, they've been in first place. They've been putting in work, but their path is only going to get tougher. Thank you, Connor. Now, we associate being successful and winning. I enjoy winning, but I don't win nearly as much as Vinton County. Two people who also win less than Vinton County are Viking reporters Tyler Corbett and Catherine Moore. What's happening in McArthur? Well, Eric, it hurts a little bit. I mean, I'm not the one in the boot after all. 
Give it a rest. Neither of you win as much as the Lady Vikings won this week. The Lady Vikings won three games in four days to finish the week 3-0. Each win was quite impressive. The week started with a 70-45 win against Wellston. Darren Radabaugh would lead all scorers, all scorers 15 points. Cassie Fenley and Aaron Jones would each have 12 points for the Lady Vikings. Looking towards the playoffs, the wins looked to solidify a seed anywhere between 4 and 8. The girls couldn't get ahead of themselves though, as they still had games to play. Yeah, Catherine, first they had to beat New Hope, and they won 60-74. to And then the Lady Vikings completed the perfect week with a 53-38 to win at Athens. And the impact on defense cannot be overstated for the girls enough this week. Let me read the scores they gave up back to you. 40, 40, and 38. No team scored over 40 points, and that is a great recipe to win games. And they stuck to that tried and tested game plan and forced Athens to commit 10 turnovers and take tough shots all night long. And I guess having an undefeated week is just a Viking thing, because the boys went 2-0 this week with wins against Jackson and Meggs, with both wins coming on the road. They first downed the Ironmen 56-53, nearly blowing a 15-point halftime lead, though. The Vikings would hold on behind the 17 points of Derrick Jones. And then Friday they took on Megs, and this game was one of the excellent defense for both teams, not giving each other an inch of space which prevented what should have been easy buckets throughout the night. When they were able to take the shots, the boys did a good job with sticking to the basics and racking up points in the paint. Nailing Yates with the top scorer of the night with 14 points, followed by Derek Jones with 12. Usually we see more out of senior Tristan Bartow, but the Marauders made it their mission to stay on top of him, and they did their best to shut him down. The game came down to the final minute, but clutch free throws helped the Vikings prevail. I mean, Vinton County as a whole, they went 5-0. and They're getting hot at the right time, and I mean, this is the time to go get a championship. Thank you too for the great work. There's always a lot to talk about in the TVC. Every Hardwood Heroes video, whether a video recap or an online segment on the program, you can find on our YouTube page at WUBPBS. This is one of the many ways you can keep up with your TBC teams throughout the week. Now, one team that is struggling to keep up is the Nelsonville York Buckeyes. They find themselves at the bottom of the TBC Ohio with little time to build momentum before the tournament. I'm here with NY reporter Thomas Garber. What, Talk about some of their struggles this season. Eric, things look so promising for the Buckeyes that have a huge season by racing out to an 8-4 record, but since then, it's been a downward spiral. The Buckeyes have now dropped five of their past six games and are in last place in TVC Ohio play at 1-8. Why aren't they able to win games, man? The offensive side of the floor has disappeared down the stretch for the Buckeyes. They were averaging over 60 points a game earlier in the year, and during this skid, they are down to 42. That's nearly a 20-point drop-off, Mr. Three. That's a big drop-off, man. How? What did they change? What changed during the second part of the season? When teams start to play you more than once, they begin to figure you out, Eric. The Buckeyes time and time again have always depended on the scoring services of seniors Aaron Davis and Hunter Edwards, and teams have taken them away. But it's not just those two, it's the entire team struggling down to knock down shots. As a team, they just shot 20% in their blowout loss to Wilson and 35% on Friday in their loss to Alexander. Now, the boys are looking for ways to win games, but the girls, they started strong. Are they finishing strong? Eric, you know how always that older sibling you always beat in everything? Well, for the Lady Buckeyes, that older sibling is the Alexander Lady Spartans, who made quick work of the Lady Buckeyes on their home floor Monday night to clinch the TVC Ohio crown 55-34. I already said earlier, Alexander is the real deal. What did the Lady Spartans do to shut down the Lady Buckeyes? This was a matchup between two star players in the TVC Ohio with Alexander's Leah Richardson and NY's Jesse Addis, but it was all Richardson in this one. She led all scores with 21 points and she took Addis completely out of the game as Addis was just 3-19 from the field. However, Addis responded to her poor performance with 22 points and a 73-6 win over Wilson on Thursday, an encouraging sign for the Lady Buckeyes as they near postseason play, Eric. They would love to have their whole squad healthy come playoff time. It's always fun talking some NY basketball with you. Thank you, Thomas. The Waterford Wildcats, they've had the pressure of being in first all year and they've dealt with this pressure flawlessly. Now the self-proclaimed greatest hardwood duo, Scott McDonald and Justin Cuddy are here with me. Why is Waterford so nice? Uh, thanks Eric for that pretty subpar introduction. But a team that does not need any introduction is the Waterford boys basketball team as they continue their dismantling of TBC hockey teams. And that's just an understatement, Scott. The Wildcats went into Tuesday's matchup against the Tomcats looking to keep intact their perfect conference record. 
Meanwhile, Trimble is looking to redeem themselves since they've lost their only conference game to the Wildcats earlier this year. Well, unfortunately for Trimble, Waterford is still king of the Hawking. Now, I will say this, Trimble did make it a game for about 16 minutes, and then in perfect Wildcat fashion, they came out in the third quarter and played a near-perfect half. And that quarter made all the difference. Coach Sims told us that heading into the locker room at halftime, tied, he said to his team, when you guys decide to play basketball, come out on the floor. Then he got up and left. Clearly, he got the message across as the Wildcats would go on an 18-1 run to close out the third quarter. Plus, you combine the seven steals in that eight-minute third quarter, really created the separation between the two teams. And then you couple in Travis Potmeyer's 19 points and nine rebound performance. That is what really made the difference in this game, which led to the Wildcats a 61-47 victory. Now, going from one team that started slow but finished fast, to another team that started fast but did not necessarily finish fast. Much like the boys, the Lady Wildcats were also defending their first place spot in the TVC Hawking against a number one contender. Eastern was coming into this game riding a five game win streak. The last time these two clashed was in mid-December with Waterford taking that one 55 to 48. Except this game did unfold a little bit different. The Wildcats started the game onto a 15 to three run to end the opening quarter. And even though the Wildcats won 37 to 33, however, my main concern of the Lady Wildcats surfaced as the Eagles shut down Allie Kern and Megan Ball in that second quarter. Eastern then went on to a 10-3 spurt to close that gap at half. And you've brought this up before, Scott. The Lady Wildcats seem to rely too much on Kern and Ball for scoring, who, by the way, combined for 30 of the 37 points in the end, but at the same time, two of the five starters went scoreless. But luckily for Waterford, Eastern is going to be not only the toughest test in the Hawking, but probably the toughest test that they will play all season. And that's going to include the state tournament where hopefully they get a chance to play once more. Man, round three. That will be a storyline right there. Eastern is going to be ready. Waterford will be ready. Let's see what happens. Thank you, guys. Now, earlier in the program, we got to hear Coach McKnight mic'd up. Online host Blake Baker has his own rendition of the Coach's Corner. Blake, what you got for us, man? Yeah, Eric, one of the reasons I love to do this show is that we get to meet some pretty interesting people. Only problem is we don't get to know them that much outside of basketball. This week, we talked to some coaches about everything from the value of basketball to the favorite music genre and really got to know them beyond the game. I wanted to have the same kind of impact on someone else. Um, if you can have that impact on one person, it's worth it. It's cliche, but you know, you got to be a part of a team your whole life. I think it teaches teamwork, discipline, you know, the ability to trust your teammates. Um, you're going to have adversity and you get a chance to deal with that. You have your highs and your lows. Through good times and bad, how to get along with other people and how to coexist and work well together. You'd say, I just hate whistles. They're too like authoritarian. I just don't like them. Uh, everyone, anyone knows me knows I enjoy the practices. It's the fastest two hours of my day. If it wasn't for uh, my coaching staff and the great kids I get to coach, I probably would have got out of them a long time ago. It's the people really more than, than the game. I've had a cat since I was 16. He's 11. Uh, he's blind, but uh, that's my boy. If you take my phone, you'll hear some Ozzy Osbourne and you'll hear some Casting Crowns, which is a religious group. I had a kid get my car the other day and change my uh, radio station to straight country. It's awful. Um, just awful. I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> my wife's a basketball fanatic, so we, we spend a lot of time in the gym. She's 37 weeks. She's due February 23rd, and the doctor told her it could happen any day, right? I got six children. She's here tonight, which I don't really like because we're an hour and a half away from our hospital we're going to use. I enjoy coaching them and being part of their lives in basketball. And it's terrifying too. It's your first one. You don't have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I, I, don't, have, I, don't, have a, I don't have a lot of other interests. All I like is basketball. Landscaping, I'm into that type of stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an HGTV guy. I like to watch that a lot, so I probably wouldn't know that. I guess I'm an old fat basketball coach. I don't even know if some of these players know about their coaches' pets or their blind pets or what they watch on TV, but nonetheless, the coaches around this area do so much for these players, and it's really been a pleasure working with them as this season has gone on. A big, fat basketball coach. Is that what he called himself? I, I love it. Hey, I mean, if he's comfortable Nothing saying that. Nothing wrong with that. That's cool. Thank you a lot, Blake. Now, another team that opened people's eyes and ears were the Megs Marauders. They challenged Vinton County, almost came away with the victory. Megs reporter Jake Hack brings you a quick summary of its week. With the end of the regular season quickly approaching, both the Meg's boys and girls teams are right in the thick of the TVC Ohio races. As the Lady Marauders look to stay right on the heels of second place Nelson, New York, and the boys look to take sole possession of second place from Athens on Tuesday, the chance to take the top spot in the TVC from Brinton County. However, it didn't go as planned. Meg's second half comeback fell short as the Bulldogs won 75-63. The struggles continued Friday as the boys lost a heartbreaker to Vinton County 60-59. 
The Lady Marauders gained some momentum for the final stretch, defeating Athens 60-38, then beating River Valley 65-34. If Megs wants to get back into that championship conversation, they have to beat Athens next week. The Bulldogs are in second place in the TBC Ohio, and reporters Taylor Nimmo and Will Collins are here to tell me about their week. We started out the Bulldogs' action this week with a doubleheader as the boys and girls both played Megs on Tuesday night. The boys were able to get the win on Tuesday, however the girls suffered a tough 60-38 loss. The Lady Bulldogs put up a fight, however they were unable to stop offensive duo Cassidy Betzing and Devin Humphreys, who together scored a combined 27 points. Megs had a 32-14 lead going into halftime, but Athens came out hot with a 7-2 run after the half but they were not able to come back and get the win for this one. How were they able to finish the week off at Fitton County? Well, Taylor, on Thursday night, it was senior night for Athens. However, they still weren't able to notch a win. Despite Laura Mandrick scoring 21 points, the Lady Bulldogs still fell to the Lady Vikings 53-38. Athens got stretched on the floor all night by Vinton County's fast-paced offense, and they outplayed Athens on the glass. Turnovers were definitely a factor in this game, which prevented Athens' offense from getting going. The Athens girls will play at Wellston from their last game of the regular season next Thursday. While the girls are wrapping up their season, the boys still have plenty of action left. How was this week for them, Taylor? Well, the boys, the boys started their week off on a high note with a 75-63 win over Megs. The Bulldogs jumped out with an early lead and appeared to have control from the very beginning. Griffin Lutz made his presence felt as he put up 19 points on Tuesday. I mean, he just makes it look easy. He knows how to control the ball and he plays smart but Griffin was not the only one with all the offensive action on Tuesday. No, he was not, Taylor. Another key contributor in the Bulldogs' victory was Dalton Cozart, as he had 14 points, and the majority of those came in the second half when they needed him most. He was hot behind the three-point line, helping Athens to pull away in this game. The Bulldogs finished their week with a win against Wellston 57-31 on Friday night. The boys will travel out to Alexander for their next conference game on Tuesday. Okay, squad, I see you putting in work. Thank you for breaking it down for us. Now, we still have things on the agenda. Molly Kennedy has a story about Eastern and their family ties. We have reporters here to break down Fedhawk and Trimble. Joseph Payton will do a fast breakdown for the Belpre girls and the Southern boys. And Blake and I still have to talk about our heroes of the week. Now, when you bring up the Eastern boys, we automatically think Jet Facemeyer. But there's two more Facemeyers. Eastern reporter Molly Kennedy is here with the details. Thanks, Eric. Brother Blaze and Cousin Sharp are also part of the team bringing the face Myers closer than ever, both on and off the court. Not only are Sharp, Jet, and Blaze great ball players, they are best friends as well. And basketball is just one more thing the family loves to do together. Us being related, I mean, we've always played basketball together at home. The chemistry is a lot better, and it's just, I know where he is at all times. I talk to him about the game. I, yeah, I hear him coaching during the game. I yell more than dad. probably anybody else during the games. Unfortunately, Blaze is out with the torn meniscus, but they are still able to enjoy themselves and make the best of what time they have left on the court. It's just not fun seeing my brother and cousin out there playing without me. I've looked forward to playing with these two for years as I knew this was going to be a good year. There's times on the court where I'm just thinking, well, what could he do to make our team better? But when it's time to get serious, the guys know how to improve not only themselves, but the whole team. With Eastern losing Jet to graduation this year, Sharp and Blaze know that they have some big shoes to fill. I want to win more ball games. Yeah, a lot. I more. feel like I want, I want our winning record after this year. I feel Every like year. I feel like our junior and senior year week will get a lot of wins. To put into perspective how big these shoes are, Jet reached his thousandth point during the season and averages roughly 20 points a game. However, the six-foot senior only has four games left this season and hopes to finish strong with his brother and cousin by his side. I'm there to play. Have fun. I mean, it's time to focus. We focus, but. We'll get off, it's fun. Like, Charlotte will be up at the point guard, I'll just go up behind and be like, hey. Yeah, they're bothering me all the time. Yeah, distracting. You know, trouble. This isn't the only sport the Face Myers play together. They all three played football in the fall, and the two brothers will run track and field in the spring. Family chemistry. Hopefully next year, for them, they will be able to put together some more wins. Thank you, Molly. Now, another team we've been watching is the Federal Hawking Lancers. The boys are the only winless team in our coverage, but the girls have doubled their wins from last season. Fed Hawk reporter Taylor Bruck joins me. What did, they do? what did the Lady Lancers do Thursday night to get their 10th win? It was a solid game for Fed Hawk's girls team Thursday night, Eric. The Lady Lancers played with high intensity, especially on the defensive end. They did a good job of cutting off passes and forcing turnovers. Kaylee McPherson had five steals, and the Lady Lancers caused 13 triple turnovers. 
Fedek was able to turn the steals into easy buckets. Offensively, it was a very balanced attack. Players like Hannah Dunphy had four threes, and the Lady Lancers drew a lot of fouls as a team. Eight of their 11 players got to the free throw line. Fedok stayed on the attack and finished strong at the rim. They demonstrated great team chemistry and had a lot of backdoor looks that they were able to capitalize on. Now they're above 500, but the boys, they are still looking for their first win. How much progress did they make this week? The Lancers lost to Wahama 63-56, which was their first single-digit loss this year. They were only down by three points with one minute left to go. FedEx started hitting threes late in the fourth quarter, which helped the Lancers gain momentum, but the lack of rebounding throughout the game did not allow them to pull ahead. They had good energy throughout the game, though, and the Lancers did a good job of taking care of the ball, only having 12 turnovers, which honestly isn't too bad for them. This was also their highest scoring game of the season, so they've definitely been improving, Eric. It, it, it looks like they're running out of time, though. They've got to put it all together. Three games left, so let's see if they can handle their business. Yep. Thank you, Taylor. Now, win, lose, or tie, we'll have the game stories from all of our games that we cover on our website at woub.org slash heroes. A lot of games we cover, a lot of teams. We try and fit it into our program, but we can't always do that. So check everything out that you need to know. And maybe you'll learn something about your team or your rivals within the TVC. Now you know we love talking about details and taking it to the next level. Joseph Payton has the honors of educating us on something of his choosing in your fast breakdown. What you got for us, man? Well, Eric, I know you like to play games, but hate to break to you. Recess is over, school's in session, and I think maybe you might need to call me Mr. Payton now. I don't play now. games. I don't play games, but it's okay. It's, it's like my classroom right now, but <laughs> back to business. Seriously, though, look, we're going to give you a little study session and dissect why Cheyenne Barker is such a threat on the floor, and then we'll switch it over and break it down to the smart athletic play of the Southern Tornado. So let's kick it off with Cheyenne Barker. So right here, you'll see she's got a one-on-one -on -one situation. She attacks the paint immediately immediately draws three defenders. The other two defenders are caught staring and her whole team is left out on the floor along the perimeter wide open. She hits the nearest guard right there, bangs it home for three. We're going the other way, three points for the Belfry Golden Eagles. She feeds her teammates. I mean, but she eats herself too. She creates for herself. What does she do? Absolutely. She attracts a lot of attention out there as we just saw. Um, and that's, you know, no matter who they're up against, she attracts a lot of attention. But she still does a great job of moving without the ball to create her own shot. So let's check this out. Right here, she immediately makes a pass and drags her defender down almost to the block, right into a screen. Boom, the screen is set, and you can chalk it up. She's going to bounce it out to the three-point line, pencil that in for three right there. You can't leave her that much space. She's just lethal out there. Not at all. That flick was so beautiful. It looked good as soon as she released it. But let's talk about the Southern boys right quick. All right, so Eric, the thing about the Southern Tornadoes that makes them so hard to defend is their athleticism. But not only that, they're smart with the basketball, and they make great decisions when the ball's in their hands. So right here, you're going to see Trey McNichol up in the corner. He gets trapped out there. That's not a good place that you really want to be. But he's athletic. He splits the defender. So now this defender in the paint has to make a decision. He's either going to step up and guard McNichol there, or he's got to slide over and guard Blake Johnson in the block. He decides to stay home. So McNichol makes the good basketball pass there. Easy money for Blake Johnson. That's two points. That's just a good basketball play. Good teams have composure, and they got to play smart. And they played smart all season long. That's right. And it's one reason why they're efficient in all facets of the game, especially when they're being pressed. Earlier this week, Belfry threw a little full court press action at them, but they handled it pretty well. So let's have a look here. Southern inbounds the ball. They quickly reverse it back to the other side of the court to get good balance. But here's the key. Cody Green over on this side. He's going to flash the middle somewhere in this big hole in the defense. They hit him in the center of the floor right where he needs to be, and it's over right there. The press is broken, and you know what? They can get into their offense now and kind of chill out. But, Eric, that's all I got for you. I think I just heard the bell ring. Class is dismissed. I, I guess you can say you earned your teacher status or whatever. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate you. Now, Joey P is extra, just like my man Reese. He has no problem with letting y'all know what's good. He's sending prayers to Fed Hawk, Trimble. Who's next? The water for boys and girls can still talk smack because they are undefeated in their conference. I haven't heard anyone challenge the Wildcats either. Don't let them verbally abuse you. Fight back and tag me in it at junior underscore three. That's three tweet of the weeks from Waterford. But I want to hear from Trimble. They got to speak, or I'm here with Nick Niehaus. You're going to speak about the struggles that they've had out in Gloucester. What's going on, man? You know, unfortunately for Trimble fans, I really don't have much good news to tell you as they ended another week winless. They started the week off with a loss at home against Miller and followed it up with a tough road matchup against Federal Hawking. The Lady Tomcats dropped their first game against Fedhawk earlier in the year, making this Trimble team hungry for revenge. But the Fedhawk defense had a plan of their own. They got up into a full court press and forced six turnovers early in the first quarter and didn't even allow a shot attempt from Trimble the first two minutes of the game. The offensive struggles from Trimble continued the entire game as they were only able to hit from beyond the arc just once. Not only were shots not falling for the Lady Tomcats, but they also had their troubles on the defensive end as well. 
Fedhawks was able to exploit Trimble's zone defense with their perimeter shooting and great ball movement. With Fedhawks' heavy defense and Trimble's offensive struggle, the Lady Lancers were able to gain a comfortable lead early on in the game and pretty much coast the rest of the way. The Lady Tomcats will look to bounce back in their next conference game when they will face Southern. Now, they aren't necessarily known for their offense, but what about the boys? Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, Eric, because if you just watched the first half of the Waterford game, you thought that they'd have everything figured out offensively. But as we all know, it takes two. You have to compete for two full halves to win a game. With both teams at the top of the Hawking and Waterford taking the first contest, Trimble needed this win in order to take a share of the conference championship. The game was tied at half, but Waterford came out strong defensively in the third. Trimble's only able to put up one point the entire third quarter and score their first field goal of the second half, coming with six minutes left in the fourth quarter. Trimble could not get any shot to fall in their half-court offense, and defensively, they just could not stop the post play from Waterford. Trimble finally had a surge of scoring late in the fourth quarter, but the game was already out of hand at that point as they fell to the Wildcats 61-49. I talked to Coach Howie Caldwell after the game, and he said that they were just missing someone to take the game into their own hands, score a bucket, and stop the avalanche of the Waterford scoring. They needed some more scoring. Who do you think can be that person to step up for the Tomcats? We know Randy Hickson and Tyler Slack, they've normally been the one-two punch this year. They really can get it done offensively. You know, at the game in the second half, they were they were getting up good shots, you know, open shots. They just none of them could fall. It seemed it seemed like there was a lid on that basket. They gotta step up, man. They gotta step up. But Nick, thank you, man. Now, who did step up this week? We always have options for our heroes of the week. Blake and I, I mean Blake is back. He's here to discuss our heroes of the week. Blake, my hero is tough. Who's your hero this week? All the heroes are tough, that's why they're heroes. Uh, but it was an outstanding week for the Federal Hawking Lady Lancers, and it wouldn't have been nearly that without the play of Hannah Dunphy, and that's why she's my hero of the week. Averaging 20 points in two double-digit victories this week, Dunphy was the Lady Lancers' leading scorer. And as opposed to chucking it up from three like she normally does, Thursday night against Trimble, she showed that she can score inside and out, with 12 points beyond the arc and 10 points inside of it. And she was four of five from three. During a season where wins and losses for Fed Hawk hinge on turnover numbers, Dunphy committed zero, zero turnovers on Thursday night. And speaking of wins, Dunphy and company have three of them in a row, and 10 wins overall doubles Fed Hawk's total from 2016. Dunphy has been a crucial part of this momentum the Lady Lancers are rolling with, and they're going to need some more out of her with the postseason right around the corner, Eric. She's been shooting lights out, and they show great team chemistry. She was cutting on some backdoor cuts, had a nice left-handed layup, She's definitely worthy of that Hero of the Week. But big boys need some love, too. Chase Harris, I got you. Harris had 26 of Alexander's 55 points Friday. Granted, they did play a team at the bottom of the conference, but he shot 80% from the field, showing great touch around the rim while being physical. Six rebounds, no turnovers, and he didn't play in the fourth quarter. That's Golden State Warrior status right there. I'm sorry, I had to do that. Having a big man, a reliable big man that not only scores, but scores efficiently, that's going to be a useful advantage as they gear up for the playoffs. And they're going to need it. They've been climbing up the TBC, putting in work. They find themselves in the third place position. They have Athens and Megas, and they got Vinton County up on top of them, man. What do you, how do you think this TBC Ohio race is going to finish out, man? I think it's Vinton County's to lose. They've pretty much shown us all year that they're, they're the dominant type. But Alexander did beat them. Uh, Athens is on the rise, too. You, you never know what's going to happen with Griffin Lutz. And Megas has looked good. They've gave him a couple games. So you never know how it could shake out, but it looks like it's the Vikings' one to lose. And Alexander, they've been putting in work as of late. They're getting hot at the right time. But it's time to shut it down. Keep up with all of our content at WOUB.org slash heroes. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Harwood Heroes. Follow your boy as well at Junior underscore three. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. I'm your host, Eric Reed II, reminding you to be heroic.